Well, as promised, I would uh, I was going to uh, teach from the uh, prayer. The Our Father it is often called the Lord's Prayer, but really the Lord's Prayer is in John chapter seventeen in the Bible. But this uh, particular prayer is actually the Lord teaching how to pray. In Matthew, it, it speaks of this here account of the Lord's Prayer, and it's also found in the Gospel of Luke. And in the Gospel of Luke, the answer that Jesus gives, is, it's interesting that it says in the Gospel of Luke chapter 11, it says, it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, when he sees one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say. And then he gives the Lord's Prayer. Well, so when he says, when you, when you pray, say. But remember that it was the disciples asking for direction in prayer. Lord teach us to pray. Now, it must have come too from hearing Jesus praying. And in hearing him pray, it must have caused them to, to consider and wonder and say, I would like to pray. I would like to pray too. And my friend, you know, it is amazing how many people like to pray and want to pray, but also feel tied up in knots about prayer. And so uh, what I've been teaching in the previous devotions is we need to get to know God. We need to get to spend time with God. If you were the shyest person on earth and eventually somehow you ended up getting married to someone, I'm sure that after a while you would open up with some communication. Um, whereas you probably wouldn't if you were in a crowd or whatever, but as you get to intimately know a person, then you're more apt to have conversation with them. And so Jesus said, In this manner, therefore pray in Matthew chapter 6. And this is what he says. And he says, I'm going to read it through, and then I'm going to give you some overall pointers on it, and then we are going to go... At one section at a time through this, it may take a few uh, lessons together, but I trust that they'll be profitable for you. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one, for yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Now, um, when we consider this prayer, it's important to notice that the first section is all about God. Now, I will say this because often when we go to prayer, the first things we are praying about is what we want, what our needs are, and about us, about us, about other people, about all kinds of other things. But if you notice that the pattern that Jesus gives to us is the first is all about God. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's all about God. I tell you, friends, that the, the starting point of prayer is about God, not about you. And I think that's vitally important to understand that, even as we look at this pattern for prayer. Then the uh, next section is about our needs and our struggles, our trials, and it concludes again with God. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So, when we look at this, we see it starts with God, and it finishes with God, and then we are in the middle of that. I tell you, friend, be in the middle of God when it comes to prayer. Make him the center of your experience, and, and you'll understand 
prayer in a much better way because your focus shifts away from yourself to God and it gives you a better understanding of what to pray for when it comes to our needs and the needs of others. So that's just a, a general quick overview of this prayer to give us that understanding. And if you haven't noticed, in the previous devotions, we have seen this over and over again. The one thing, choose the good part. Better is one day in your courts. Focus on the Lord first. So my friend, take time to worship God. Take time to be in the presence of God. And you will have a much more effective prayer life when it comes to the interceding part of it. Okay, so I wanted to give you that little introduction on this uh, famous, well-known passage. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of people have prayed this prayer over and over. But sometimes I wonder what they're actually thinking when they're praying it. We already saw that much speaking or repeating this over and over again is not God's plan. It's for you to understand what's being said. Now there's absolutely nothing wrong with praying this prayer together as a congregation. And, and I admit sometimes we should do this and we don't. But I sometimes feel like we have made it such a rote thing that Often people aren't really thinking about what's being said. So let's dig into this, and we're going to dig fairly deep into this passage of Scripture because there's so much blessing here. And I want to start with the first word, our. He didn't say my Father, but our Father. Jesus was including us in the Father heart of God. Not only was he including us, but he was including one another. So there is a sense here, at the very beginning, as Jesus teaches us to pray, there is a consciousness of others. That we are part of a body. My friend, this prayer really finds its reality, its strength, and its power when you become a believer in Jesus Christ. You, you don't understand the fullness of this and you won't appreciate it unless you have given your heart to Christ. If you have become a Christian, that is, if you have come into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ where you know that you are saved, then it all comes into perspective so that we can say, Our Father. We have a, a, a very good understanding from the Word of God that we are called to love one another, to be with one another, to walk with one another, that it is vital in our relationship with God. You cannot have a right relationship with God if you have a wrong relationship with others. Get it fixed. And we'll see that later on in this very psalm, in this very prayer that Jesus is offering to us. So the word hour is not insignificant. Have you thought about it? Have you thought about just the word our, Father? That it was meant to be an understanding that, Lord, I'm not just coming all by my little lonesome here, but I am part and parcel of the body of Christ, and it, you are our Father, which instantly says that everyone else is my brother and sister, and it means that I must walk in fellowship with them. There's a sense of a coming together, into the presence of God. I suppose that is one reason why this is a good corporate prayer because of the word our. So that's a little something for you to think about when it comes to this particular prayer, our. But now I want to get to the word father and see what does that mean? Well, this word would have been a little bit of a shock for the Jews to hear uh, Jesus using it in this way. Our father here the word means papa or daddy our papa our daddy who is in heaven this is intimate this speaks of closeness this speaks not of aloofness you see for the jews many of them had come to the place where it was all pomp and ceremony and it was all uh, ritual but there was no intimacy there was no closeness to god 
There was no understanding of the Father heart of God. Now, it's not that it wasn't there in the Old Testament. It was there. God is addressed as Father in the Old Testament. And I could take you to verses, but for time's sake, I just want you to see that even though you can know a lot of the Bible, sometimes you miss the reality of intimacy in your relationship with God. So Jesus starts out this prayer with our Father, our Papa, our Daddy. Oh, friends, it is an amazing truth that God is not only the Father of all creation, you see, in the book of Acts, chapter 17, the Apostle Paul was uh, going to uh, speak. He stood up and spoke in, this, uh, uh, in the Areopagus, which was in, uh, as he came uh, to the city, and when he got to this city, in Athens it was, he says, you know, men, I perceive that you are very religious. Because I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship, I even found an altar of this inscription to the unknown God. He said, therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. Paul says, listen, I want you to get to know who this unknown God is. He's knowable. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't dwell in temples made with hands, as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life and breath and all things, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. He has determined their pre-appointed times, the boundaries of their dwellings, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope they might grope for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being. So we can see from this passage that God is the father of all the human race because he is the divine creator. He made every one of us. As a result of that, we can say, yes, God is the father of everyone by creation. But my friends, I want you to know something, that God is not the father of everyone by relation. You see, when we look in the word of God, we discover in John chapter 1, verse 12, it says this very clearly, as many as received him, to them he gave the power or the right or privilege to become one of the children of God, even to those who believe in his name. So it is obvious, even though we are all God's creation, we are all children of God by creation, if it was true that we were children of God by relation, this verse wouldn't be there. It says, to as many as received him, to those who believe in his name, he gives them the right to become the children of God. The children of God. That means that he's our father, we are his children. And so even if you may be a child of God by creation, you still need to become a God, child of God by relation, by receiving Jesus Christ as your Savior. If you miss this, I'm afraid you'll miss heaven because you must become a child of God in order to go into his heaven. That is a child by relation. I hope I'm making this clear to you that when Jesus is praying our Father, we can say that, yes, in the general sense of, of creation, but I believe he's intimately speaking of relation. So I can say our Papa, our Daddy. Years ago, the President of the United States was in a very important meeting, and he had all his uh, um, consultants there with him, his advisories. He was in the Oval Office and it was a, a, an important meeting. But this one person comes along and they go through the guards at the front. They go through the secretary. They go through everyone. They swing open the Oval Office door, walk in, right in. Nobody stops them. Nobody says anything to this person walk in and climbs up in the president's lap. 
How could he, this person do that? Because it was his little son. His little son had rights and privileges and access that nobody else did. Anybody else that's going to come to see the president has got to go through all the checks and balances and searches and everything else and able to get into that Oval Office, but not the little son. Why? Because he is his son. So you see, even though the president is president over the whole nation, yet he is of intimate father to his son. That's the way it is with God. Even though the all of creation is under the rule of Almighty God, of course, and he's the very creator, because of sin, we've, we've rebelled and we've moved away from our relationship with God. But God has created a way for us to have full access, to become his little children, so that we can come right in to the throne room of heaven and, yes, crawl up in his lap. Now, this doesn't take away from his majesty. It doesn't take away from his authority and his glory and everything else. But I want you to know, as God was teaching us to pray, he started with the place of intimacy with God. For my friend, if I don't know that I can have intimacy with God, I really won't come. Nor will I come properly. Nor will I understand who I'm coming to. And so I, I don't want to take away from his majesty. We'll get to that. But he starts with the place of intimacy. Our Father. Oh, friends, this is so beautiful. And it is so encouraging to see this. You see, we have been given the privilege. If you are a Christian today, you've been given the privilege to be born into the family of God. You don't get born into the family of God by physical birth. You get born into the family of God by a spiritual birth. That's what John chapter 3 teaches us. That's why Jesus said that a person has to be born again to enter or even see the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not saying that. The Bible says that. The Bible teaches that we need a new birth, that we need a spiritual birth. And Jesus explains what it is. We find it there in John chapter 1, verse 12. When we receive him, we become one of the children of God. And this spiritual birth that we experience is actually a birth that's, that's actually labeled as being caused by adoption of all things. And that's what we discover in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 8, it tells us this. It says, brothers, we are debtors not to live to the flesh, that according to the flesh. We're, we're not to live according to the, the desires of this world. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God, the sons of God. This is what he's called you to. This is the incredibleness. He's called you to be a son or a daughter of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery and a place of fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father, Papa, Daddy. There it is again. Because the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And we end up being joint heirs with Christ. This is amazing. This is the call of God in our lives. Galatians chapter 4 says the same thing. It says, When the fullness of time had come, Galatians 4.4 4. God sent forth his son born of a woman born under the law to redeem those who were under the law that we might receive the adoption as sons and because you are sons God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying out Abba Father Papa Daddy so you no longer are a slave but a son and if a son then you're an heir of God through Christ when we consider what was said here in the gospel of Matthew 
when he says, Our Father <clears throat> who is in heaven. My friend, it is not a small thing to understand and to recognize that he becomes your papa and he becomes your spiritual papa. But he's a good God. He's a good father. Some of you may have had bad experiences. Sadly, some of you may have had bad fathers. Fathers who didn't love you. Fathers who didn't treat you properly. Fathers who didn't respect you. And sadly, it may be even some in the sound of my voice who had fathers who have abused you. This is not God. God is a good father. We know that he loves us so much that he sent his only begotten son into the world to be our savior, that he went to the cross to die for our sins. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So we know that we have a father who deeply and richly cares for us. I want you to know this, friends, that if you are not, not a Christian, you can come, but you're coming to a father who really loves you, who longs to adopt you. My first wife and I, we longed to have children. Oh, we prayed for children, but we weren't able to have any. And uh, time was marching on, and I think I was around 36 years old, and still no children. But an opportunity came up for a private adoption. And we, we were so thrilled and so amazed. I can tell you, when we took that baby home, you couldn't find happier parents on the planet. We longed for children, and God was gracious to give us a child. And we loved her, and I still love her. Wonderful what God did there. But my friend, the longing that we had and the, and the joy that we experienced is only a candle to the longing that God has to make you his child, to adopt you out of sin, to adopt you out of the misery of this world, to adopt you into a place of intimacy with him where he becomes your loving father, a loving father who will do what a loving father does, and that is care for his children. That is, watch over his children. That is, be with his children, not abandoning, but with them. As he said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That will discipline his children. That will correct his children, because a good father does that. Hebrews chapter 12 tells us that. All these wonderful truths are wrapped up in our Father, our Heavenly Father. Oh, my friend, don't miss the reality of this. When the next time you either say this prayer or think about prayer, start from the place of intimacy. Start from the place of understanding how great is your God. That this is our Father who is in heaven. Yes, you have earthly fathers or had an earthly father. Even if you never knew him, you had one. But this is your heavenly Father. And what that, even that word itself brings so much to us because it says there's no higher father that I could ever have. There's no one that I could go to who's a better protector, a better savior, a better, better one to watch over me, a better one to be able to see the past, the present, the future, who has all things under his control. There's so much I could say just about the fact that our father is in heaven. Because heaven is his throne and the earth is his footstool. He looks down upon the whole earth. He sees all things. He knows all things. And yet this one who is in heaven with all of his glory and his authority and power and majesty, I can crawl up in his lap. I can come to him. Our Papa, our Daddy. Oh, don't miss the real thing, friends. Oh, maybe we need to have a total readjustment on what our concept is of God and prayer. The Jews certainly needed it. And you know what? I need it every day. I need to be reminded every day of the goodness of my Father and the love that He has and the care that He gives, that He is a good Father, our Papa. My friend, today I ask you, I challenge you, is He really your Papa? Do you have any intimacy with God at all? Or somehow have you missed all of this? 
then even if you've been full of religion, even if you said this prayer a thousand times, my challenge to you today is to come to Jesus Christ and receive him as your personal Lord and Savior. Become a spiritual child of God. Be adopted into his family and receive all of that intimate, tender care that will be with you, that he will adopt you, keep you, save you, and be with you for time and for eternity. You know, sometimes, children, we fail our parents, don't we? But they don't kick us out. They don't say, I'm done with you. That's not what a father does. A father loves their child and keeps them and, and does everything that needs to be done to win them and to hold them and to serve them. Oh, my friend, there's the intimacy our Father, who art in heaven. That's our beginning of this prayer. We have much more to look at, but may you be blessed, and may you ponder on these things and think about them. If you're a Christian, ah, oh, don't hang back. All the way in. All the way into the Holy of Holies. To a God who loves you intimately, wonderfully, to put his arms around you and pick you up just as Jesus picked up those infants when the disciples were saying, oh, he hasn't got time for you. I want you to know God has all the time in the universe for you. Don't miss this reality. I pray. Father, our Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your loving arms reaching out to a broken world. Lord, let us come running to you. And we thank you, Father, you will not turn anyone away who genuinely will come. We ask for this and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So, my friend, if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, you will hear uh, an address, an email address. Email me. And you can become a child of God. You can believe in him. You can do that on your own. But if you need help, just send me a message and I will be in contact with you. May the Lord bless you until we come together next time and we look at the phrase, Hallowed be your name. God bless. Now here's a song I'm going to close with. It's called, No Longer Slaves. Now I'm a child of God. Not a slave to sin, Satan. Not a slave to the world system. But a child. Oh, that email address is shettycampchristianchurch at gmail.com. You can send a, off a note to me, and I'll respond to you. shettycampchristianchurch at gmail.com. You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name I've been born again into your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child God. I'm no longer a 
slave to fear I am a child of God You split the sea so I could walk right through it All my fears were drowned in perfect love you rescued me so I could stand and sing I am a child of God You split the sea so I could walk right through it All my fears were drowned in perfect love You rescued me so I could stand and sing, I am a child of God, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child